For those of you who don't know me, I ran a record label for about 20 years called Spin Art Records. Got to release bands like the Pixies, Echo and the Bunnymen, the Eels, Apples and Stereo, and my other sort of favorites from high school and college. Launched a company, helped to launch a company called eMusic, 1997-98, first online digital music service. And then in 2005, as my label went down in flames, I launched a company called TuneCore, which grew to become the largest music distribution company in the world. I feel self-aggrandizing here. So as you may or may not know, in the United States, we have copyright law. And this copyright law says the minute that you create a song, okay, and I'm going to break this into two parts. When you create a song, you um, get these sort of six copyrights with it, these sort of six slices of copyright. So I'm going to go to Whitney Houston recording, I Will Always Love You, which one of you will have to perform before I leave today. <laughs> you. No. Um, Whitney Houston records, I Will Always Love You, and that was released by Sony Records. So Sony Records owns the copyright to the recording of the song. There's one copyright in all of its glory. But who wrote the lyrics and melody to I Will Always Love You? So she was divorcing her husband in the 70s, as I've read, and she wrote a song called I Will Always Love You about her soon-to-be ex-husband. So there is your second copyright in that piece of recorded music. The lyric and the melody is performed by Dolly Parton. So Dolly Par Parton controls the lyric and the melody, which is called a composition, which is referred to as music publishing, which can be really confusing. And then the recording of the song is controlled by Sony Records. So I'm going to be focusing in on the Dolly Parton side of things. So if any of you have written a song, anyone here ever write a song? By default, the minute you made that song tangible, meaning you either wrote it down or it got recorded, you got copyright protection. And you get these six sort of slices of copyright. And I'm going to rattle them off, but I'm only going to really focus on one now. The one I'm going to focus on has to do with the right of reproduction, which of course is the sexiest of these copyrights. Uh, the right of reproduction, the right of public performance, the right of derivatives, public display, uh, digital transmissions, and distribution. Those are sort of the six slices you get when you make your song tangible. I know it's confusing. I'm sorry, I only have a half an hour. Um, as I'm rambling, by the way, feel free to throw questions up. Otherwise, I'll, I'll lose somebody somewhere on this stuff because copyright became my pornography. I don't know why. Anyway. <coughs> Sad but true. So the, um, the one I'm going to focus on is reproduction. And the right of reproduction, and for the lawyers in the room, I know I'm cutting some corners here, basically says every time your lyric and melody is reproduced, someone needs a license for that, and they need to pay you. Now, reproduction is I manufacture a CD which has your lyric and melody on it. It doesn't matter if you recorded it or somebody else recorded it. Dolly Parton wrote I Will Always Love You, Whitney Houston recorded it for Sony. Every time Sony made a CD, it was Dolly Parton's lyric and melody being reproduced, so she had to get licensed and paid. A reproduction is a USB stick, a reproduction is a cassette, an eight-track tape, a piece of vinyl, anything physical is a reproduction. A reproduction then expanded when things like downloads came into the marketplace. They're called digital phonographic downloads, T D. PDs. So you go to iTunes and you download a song in the United States, guess what? It's a reproduction. That means if you wrote the lyric and melody, I'll go to him, he wrote the lyric and melody, and you recorded his song, and you had that song up, the recording up in iTunes, and it was purchased, of course it would be, a uh, hundred thousand times, you would have to get paid, even though she recorded it. The law then began to get a little confused because this sort of weird thing came up next where people were no longer buying pre-recorded music. They were now renting other people's music. Spotify. These are called interactive streaming services. An interactive streaming services is basically you're renting someone else's music collection and you can use it however the hell you want. Start, stop, rewind, skip, share with your friends, listen to it over and over and over. You'll notice you can't do that with Pandora. right? Pandora is considered non-interactive, so it falls into a different legal category. So no, you are not owed royalties for the right of reproduction from Pandora, but you are from Spotify because it's an interactive service. Interactive again means it's like your own music. It's on your, instead of being on your hard drive, it's on somebody else's hard drive, but you can treat it like it's your own. Start, stop, skip, rewind as many times as you like, whereas with Pandora, you can only listen to the same artist, I think, twice in the same half hour. 
You can't listen to the exact song that you want to. You can only skip five times, you guys. Is that right, in the, in the first half hour? Uh, you can't go backwards, right? So that's considered non-interactive. Think of Pandora like AM, FM radio, and think of Spotify as your own music collection. So the law said, okay, now we got this weird hybrid thing where you can stream music on demand, and when you can do that, is there the right of reproduction being done, and if so, we need a license and we need to pay somebody. And the way things shook out is the answer was, yeah, we agree that under the law in the United States that the right of reproduction exists for more or less for a stream. So with that backdrop, let's move into how many of you have actually written a song and either recorded it yourself or someone else has, and it's been streamed on Spotify? Okay. Under the law, here's the way this right of reproduction works, and I'm just going to stick with the United States because it differs in other countries. Actually, the U.S. is different than everywhere else, which is kind of the way it always is, for better or for worse. <clears throat> in the United States, you don't get to say no once your song has been commercially released. You cannot say, Spotify, I do not want you to use my lyric and melody. Rhapsody, you do not get to do it. You, de you get no choice. The government metaphorically comes into your home, puts a gun to your head, and says, I'm removing choice, which is kind of weird because Orrin Hatch, who's a Republican on the right, likes to deny choice in other areas as well, but uh, I guess he likes to carry it over to here. So you don't have a choice. There's something called the compulsory license. You are compelled to have to give Spotify a license to your lyric and melody, whether it's your own recording or someone else's, in return, though, Spotify, Rhapsody, Beats, Google Play, RDO, Mog, Lala, Zune, whatever the hell it is, have to follow the rules. So the rules say, number one, they can't say no, but you have to do a couple things. The first thing you have to do is issue, you have to get a license. So I'm going to stick with, with you for a moment. Your song is up in Spotify before that recording of your song can go into Spotify, you are supposed to get a notice of intent, N-O-I. I intend on using your music in my service. The reason why you are required to get the notice of intent is so you can go, aha, now I know someone's using my lyric and melody and I know where I'm supposed to get paid from. If they do not send you a notice of intent, if you've written a song in this room and that song exists on Spotify, and you have not gotten this thing that I'm talking about, and you're like, what is that? Your song, Lyric and Melody, is unlicensed. Your copyright is now being infringed upon. It's copyright infringement. They do not have a right to do that without a license. So they either have to send you this notice of intent, which literally says, hey, this is Spotify, this is the name of your song, and we're going to use it. Or they got to call you up and say, would you mind if we got a direct license? Yeah, here's a contract. Let's just sign it. If they don't do one of those two things, they are unlicensed. Just FYI. The second thing that they have to do, amongst many others, is they have to pay you on the 20th of the month for the previous month. So on February 20th, you are required to get paid by these streaming services, shut off my phone, the money you are owed from the interactive stream of your lyric and melody embodied in a sound recording. Right? Now the amount of money you're supposed to get paid is also not open to negotiation. The US government has decided they're going to set that rate for you. Okay, this is called a mechanical royalty. Talking about mechanical royalties right now, you might have heard that term, maybe you haven't, but this is what we're talking about. So every time there is a stream of your song on Spotify, etc., you are not only supposed to be licensed, but you're supposed to get paid a mechanical royalty. Now, the mechanical royalty rate that the government sets, and I hope I'm not boring you guys to tears with this stuff, because it's hard to talk about this and make an exciting beyond the fact that they're taking your money um, if it is a download or it's on physical like vinyl cassette the rate right now is 9.1 cents a little less than a dime unless it's over five minutes in which case it's a formula of 1.74 or 75 I can't remember 1.74 cents per minute above five minutes that's the penny rate. It's, it's, it's codified. It's, it's like a hard number. 9.1 cents per download or per physical piece of product being manufactured is paid to you as a mechanical royalty on that download or physical. On a stream, it is not a penny rate. It is a percentage. Okay, so 
I'm going to really dumb this one down because I still haven't been able to decipher the whole damn thing. The amount of money you get paid for each stream on Spotify for the lyric and the melody is approximately 10.5% of their gross revenue in that month minus the cost of public performance. What is left over then gets prorated out. So let's say there was $1.5 million in the pot at the end of the month. The cost of public performance, which gets paid for a different legal copyright, was $500,000. That leaves a million dollars in the pot. If there were a million streams and a million dollars in the pot, each stream is worth $1. If there were two million streams, it's 50 cents, et cetera, et cetera, right? So as you get more streams or more money or one goes up, it, it varies. So it's a percentage rate, not a flat penny rate. That's the very simplified version of it. But the non-simplified or the important part of this is if you've written a lyric and a melody and your song streams on Spotify, you're now owed the mechanical royalty for the interactive stream of the recording of your song. If you have not been paid that money, geez, that was fast. If you've not been paid that money, your copyright is being infringed and you can notify the service that they're not paying you when they should be and then they're going to lose that compulsory license, which then frees you takes off the handcuffs to negotiate anything you want. Now, here's another really important point in the US. I've talked to a lot of people that say, but I'm already getting paid my mechanical royalties, right? I use CD Baby, I use TuneCore, I use Ditto, I use Zimbla, whatever. And my distributor, my record label's paying me. Yes, they are, on the downloads. Because the law in the United States says that the mechanical royalties owed from a physical or download get to, get to be paid by the label or the distributor to the songwriter publisher for the lyric and melody. But the law also says on a stream, uh-uh, can't do that. Spotify's got to pay you directly. That means you are not getting your second income stream from your label or your distributor. So let's put this back into really tangible form. You've written a song, it's been recorded, it's streamed on Spotify. Let's assume you've gotten a notice of intent, so now they have a license. That song streams. On the 20th of the month, under the compulsory license, you have to get accounted to and you have to get paid. If they do not do that, they are in breach of the license that you are in with them. That means your money hasn't been paid out. That means you've got money sitting there right now that you've generated that they're not paying out. Does all that so far make sense? Are there any questions on any of that? Yes. I've received letters of intent for the license from a third party uh, collecting service called Music Reports. Yes. And I'm just wondering what gives them any kind of right to even kind of step in the middle of my Great business. Great question. Which and, is a and what is the actual impact yep. that they have? So that was a perfect segue to the next thing I was going into. Great question. Okay, so why aren't you getting paid? How many people here have a song that they and that's been recorded, that's been on Spotify, that's streamed, and have never been paid a mechanical royalty. Okay, your own money, it's earned, it's just sitting there. They're an infringement of copyright law, you're not getting paid, and they're making money off of you to reach their 10 billion plus exit. The problem is, no digital music service, I don't care who it is, Beats, Mug, Microsoft, Xbox, uh, Lala, Zune, Audio. Midwest Tape, Slacker, you name it, these interactive services, not one of them built the infrastructure to deal with making these payments. Nobody built it. They built it for the sound recording side, the Sony record side, but they did not build it for the songwriter side. So what do they do? They hired third parties. They literally said, fuck, I don't want to deal with this, man. You know, you, can you just, here, could you deal with this each month? And they send this gentleman right here a usage log at the end of the month. And they say, here is a list of 29 and a half million sound recordings in Spotify. Go deal with this. Now, this poor guy said, great. <clears throat> he now has to take every one of those sound recordings and map them back to a lyric and melody. So... He writes a song called Butterfly and records it and puts it up and it goes into, congratulations, into Spotify and it streams. 
Is it the Mariah Carey version of Butterfly? Is it the Jason Mraz version of Butterfly? Is it the Crazy Town version of Butterfly? Or is it a brand new version of Butterfly? Or is it somebody else's version of Butterfly? And how is he supposed to know that? This poor guy has to sit and figure out for 29 and a half million sound recordings, I'm going to map it, this song, back to this composition. And he's not going to listen to it. He's got to build a computer system that does this. And computer systems are dumb. They need ways to link things together. Sound recording composition, how do I link them together? So he's got to figure out a way to do that. After he figures out what it's a recording of, he then needs to figure out, oh, well, now that I know it's a recording of this particular lyric and melody, who controls it? Then he's got to figure out how to map the, the lyric and melody back to the people that wrote the song. So let's go with uh, Daft Punk and um, uh, Get Lucky. There's like eight different entity people that wrote that song. So he's going to have to figure out, get lucky, get split up into these different percentages, and on the 20th of the month has to make a micropayment, or whatever it is, to each one of those songwriter publishers in order to comply with the compulsory license. And frankly, it's pretty much of an impossible task. And by the way, next month that 29 and a half million sound recordings becomes 30 million. And then the following month it's 30.25. So it just keeps growing. Every single fucking month since these services launched, okay, every single month between 15 to 30% of those sound recordings were never mapped and matched back to a lyric and melody. They never were mapped and matched and they were never paid out on. Okay, I, Audium, yes, I'm doing a shill for Audium for two seconds. This is sort of the things that I, I fix. So for just 25 of my customers, which include the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Jason Mraz, Metallica, but for some sub-portion of them, I went and I did their work for them. I cleaned up their database for just 25 catalogs. Now, there's like 70 to 100,000 publishers of note in the world, entities that represent these lyrics and melody. I got $60,000 in interactive streaming mechanical royalties dating back to 2007, three weeks ago, because I went in and I fixed up their fucking problem, which is your money that they're using so they can sell iPhones, so that they can sell computers, get market share, do their IPOs, raise venture capital. You think SoundCloud's gonna pay you accurately? You think they're gonna build the infrastructure for this? I hope so, because they just raised $100 million off of your works. If they're gonna use your music, could they at least pay you accurately? Is that really a big ask? Microsoft, how would you feel about it if each month you only got paid 80% of the money you owe were earned from the credit card company because they couldn't figure out how to map the other 20%? Would that be acceptable to you? Then why should it be acceptable to them? Sorry, this stuff just pisses me off. Yes, sir. How come more publishing and owners of these rights haven't been suing these services? Good question. Well, the answer to that has to do with, uh, in some cases, the major music publishers. So the first thing is this is a very dense area. It's complicated. The royalties aren't clear. It takes a freak like me to go in and, and just do nothing else but read this stuff. And once you've got that knowledge base, the second thing is, should I pay attention to it now? Or am I more interested in one live gig where I'll make more money in one night than I will off of five years of Spotify? What are my priorities? There's only so much time in the day. Now the money is beginning to matter. So that's the first thing. Second thing is the Entities that could really have driven the change to this, I don't want to say they were bought off, that's not fair to them. They received very large advances. Okay, so if you're a very large music company and you get prepaid your money, what happens after that, for the most part, you don't care about. Now on top of that, not only are you getting prepaid the money, but you're getting an equity position in the company. The major labels own over 6% of Spotify. Where do you think they'll make more money, from the use of their music in Spotify or off of the IPO of Spotify. And by the way, if you are a band or an artist or a songwriter or a publisher that is in a deal with one of the major music companies, check your contracts to see if there's a provision that offers you a royalty from an exit. There is no exit royalty. So when Spotify does its IPO and that money gets split between the major music companies of which there are three and it reap in hundreds of millions of dollars, no artist, no publisher, no songwriter gets their share in that at all, even though it was their works that caused it to happen. So that's one reason. Second reason is the music industry is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Music publishing is about licensing. The companies using the music are technology companies. They build hardware, software, 
And what they did is they created very complicated pieces of technology, and they turned to the sex, drugs, and rock and roll and, and music publishers and said, hey, have your in-house engineer that writes machine language in XML2 code. Uh, please act, provide an XML metadata feed via an FTP authenticated drop where we'll input into our non-relational big data cloud-based infrastructure uh, the relational aspects of a master and a composition to allow for our business logic to apply to pay you that money each month. What? That's not what the fucking music industry does. That was a fast half hour. <laughs> I got five minutes left. So the, the end result is if you receive an advance on your money and the data is bad in the database, think about this. If the data is bad in the database, which it is, by the way, which is another reason why these things aren't mapped and matched, what does that mean? That means you as the record label don't get the royalty statement that says, hey, this composition earned X amount this month, which means you get to keep more of the advance because you don't have to pay royalties on it. Bad data works to the advantage of people that receive advances. And they get to dip again when there's an exit through an IPO or they get purchased, which they don't have to share back with the creators. So back to the question. Oh, yes. So thank you. So how does this tie into Music Reports? Music Reports is one of the third-party companies that exist in the United States that gets hired to deal with the administration of the mechanical royalties. So uh, Music Reports works for Microsoft, who are closing at the end of the year, AT&T Move, who are also closing at the end of the year, uh, RDO, Slacker, Midwest Tape, Omniphone, which is the back end for Sony's interactive streaming service. So they all turn to them and say, eh, here, Music Reports, let me pay you money to go do this job and get this money out. The other company that does that in the United States is called HFA, sometimes called the Harry Fox Agency, which used to be on the other side of the fence, but now they're on this side of the fence. So what happens is Spotify, Rhapsody hire HFA and send them their usage logs to do this and pay out the money uh, when they're supposed to. Then you've got Medianet, which does Beats. That's really the big one. And then the final one is RightsFlow, which was acquired by Google, and RightsFlow pays out the money for uh, Google Play, for the mechanical royalties. That's why you're getting the notices of intent from them because they've been hired by these third-party companies, but your instinct is correct. You're not in a deal with Music Reports. You're in a deal with Spotify. And that... That's right. So uh, long story short to all this is um, I got tired of this. You know, with TuneCore, I was frustrated with artists getting screwed by to be given access to distribution. With Audium, I'm hired by music publishers, publishing administrators, songwriters to go out on their behalf and go and get you your money. And what I will do is I will go in, I will find the sound recordings of your songs, I will get the data necessary, because I built systems to do this, put it in so we'll get the name of your song, what percentage you control, who the songwriter is, who the publisher is, who the publishing administrator is, all the identifiers necessary. And then I take that information and I re-deliver it to them. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know it? Oh gosh, I guess we weren't paying you accurately, would you? You know, and no, you weren't. Uh, even though you're doing your IPO next week. And um, I'll leave it with this. I was on the phone with the attorney for, and I'll, I'll leave the services nameless as was someone else in this room. And the attorney for the uh, interactive streaming services insisted, he said to me, listen, we're not going to invest in the infrastructure to pay on time. We're not gonna do it. And uh, what's the big deal? It's not a lot of money anyway. I was like, really? If you're gonna use music to sell Xboxes and Xbox subscriptions or make, raise your market cap, that's fine. Just pay on time and pay accurately. And if you can't do that, Go create your own fucking music. Oh, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah, that's why music has value. So invest in the infrastructure. If you're going to use someone else's property to make your billions of dollars and freaking pay them, if you're not going to do it, then stop using it. And I think I'm out of time, right? Okay. Thank you very much.